When you hear the sound of a car going past, it has quite a distinctive effect. In fact, if you try to mimic it or explain to somebody that a car went past, you'll often make this kind of sound. Now, why do you make that sound? Why is the sound different as the car is coming towards you than when the car is going away? And it's not just different in any old way, it seems to go from a higher note to a lower note. Well, what's going on here is a, is a wave phenomenon we call the Doppler effect. Now, something must be happening to the wave because we know that the properties of frequency and wavelength are what we hear as the note or the pitch of the sound wave. Now, they're related to the speed by the speed equals frequency times wavelength. Now, certainly as the car moves past us, it can't be changing the speed of sound, so the velocity v must be staying the same. Something must be happening to the frequency and wavelength of the sound as the car goes past. We'll look at an example now where the red dot on your screen is showing you something that's emitting sound waves. If there's a blue circle around it, that's the crest of the first sound wave that's come out from that little source of sound. It could be, for example, a siren on an ambulance, or maybe as you've driven your car past, you've hit the horn and it's making a sound. Now in this first example, that sound, that red dot, is going to be sitting still. And we can see those sound waves moving outwards from the red dot. They're moving out in all directions. You can also see they're nice and evenly spaced in all directions. No matter where you were standing next to that stationary object, you'd hear the same sound, the same wavelength, the same frequency. Let's change it and make that red dot move now. What you see happening now is as the red dot is moving and emitting sound, there's clearly a difference between what you would hear if you were standing off to the right of that or if you were standing off to the left. Because the dot is moving towards the right, we can see those sound waves are kind of bunching up. The distance between each of those wave crests is now smaller than it was before. On the other side, on the left-hand side, the point from which the sound is moving away from, those wavelengths are now spread out. Those crests are further apart, and you'd hear a longer wavelength. And this explains what we'd said before. As the car is moving towards you, the waves bunch up and you hear a higher note. As the wave is moving past you, the waves spread out and you hear a lower note. It's because the thing that's sending out the wave is moving relative to what the wave is moving through. That is, in this case, the air. Now let's have a little bit of a closer look at how this calculates. So we're looking now at our friend the car, the example we've been using quite a lot. To start with, we'll think about our car sitting still. Now, our car's going to be making a noise. Maybe it's the revving of the engine, maybe it's you blaring on your horn, maybe there's a loud sound system in your car, but your car is going to be making some noise, and we'll see here, if our car is sitting still, I'll call the speed of the car for the time being U. And U at the moment is going to be zero. Our car is sitting still. Now, the noise that it's going to make is going to send out a sound wave. There's the first crest of the sound wave. It's the one that's going to arrive uh, to you. You're standing there listening first. And then sometime later, it'll send out the next sound wave, and sometime later, another sound wave. Clearly, we've slowed things down quite a lot here so we can see what's going on. Now, the distance between these sound waves will, of course, be the wavelength. Each of these represents a wave crest. And for the time being, we might call that wavelength lambda with a zero under it to remind us this is the wavelength when the car is not moving, when our source of sound is stationary. Now, how long does it take? What's the time between these? The time between these is the period of that wave. And we can write the period down here as the speed of the, of the uh, sorry, the wavelength of the wave, lambda zero, divided by the speed of the wave, there, v. So there's two speeds we've got to keep track of now. The speed of the source of sound, in this case it's still, so it's zero, and the speed of sound, in this case we're calling that v. Now, the interesting part, of course, happens when we let our car start to move. So now let's have our car moving along here at some speed u towards us. And that u is not going to be zero at all. It's going to be some speed. We'll see in a minute how that affects things. Of course, at some point, it's going to emit the first wave, and there it is arriving to you. Now, before it gets a chance to emit the second wave crest, the car's moved a little bit. So here's our car. It's moved along. So when it sends out the second wave crest, it actually arrives at you a bit sooner than it would have otherwise, compared to the top diagram there. 
it's actually a bit closer towards you because before the car got to emit that wave, it moved a bit closer towards you. And so in fact we can see that third wave, when the car is moved again before it emits the third wave, that third wave is going to be a little bit closer again. That's the same effect we saw earlier, where when the sound source is moving towards you, those waves bunch up. But how much do they bunch up? Well, how far did the car move, for example, from this point here to this point here? What was that distance that the car moved along? Well, that distance will be equal to the speed of the car, u, multiplied by the time that it was moving for. Well, that's the period of the wave. That's how long it moved between emitting the first wave and emitting the second wave. And we can write that now, that distance that it's moved, um, as u multiplied by the period, which of course is the wavelength lambda zero divided by the speed of the wave v. And so this wavelength in here, the new wavelength, which I'll call lambda, as a function of the speed u. So that lambda, which depends upon the speed u, that will equal the wavelength that we started with, but they're all a little bit closer together. They're a bit closer together by this number here, u times lambda naught over v. That's the distance the car moved. And then we can actually nicely collect this. This is the original wavelength, lambda zero, into one minus u divided by v. A fairly simple formula. You can see the wavelength gets shorter and shorter depending upon the size of u. Now those of you with a mathematical bent might look at that equation and think, what happens when u equals v? Something quite interesting happens. u divided by v will equal one and we'll have a wavelength of zero. What does that mean? Well, in fact, something strange does happen when you're moving at the speed of sound. The waves can't get away from you, and in fact they bunch up all together, and you form what's called a sonic boom or a shock wave. Uh, and those of you familiar with supersonic aircraft and the effects they have flying over cities, it's, uh, it's something that's not terribly good. It is this, this shock wave, this, this very loud disruption. It's not a linear wave, it's not a wave that we've been talking about in this particular unit, but it is what happens when, when you actually travel at or above the speed of sound. And you can see that in the Doppler effect formula right there. We can do exactly the same thing here if the car was moving away from us, playing some sound, except the waves would now get further apart by that same distance that we just saw in this example right now. Now, Doppler effect doesn't just affect sound. The Doppler effect is true for all kinds of waves. In fact, you might be familiar with the idea of looking up a weather forecast and see something that says Doppler radar. That's where they're using radio waves to bounce off things like clouds. They can tell how fast the clouds are moving by the change in the wavelength of the signal that comes back. The, the cloud being the sound source is either moving towards us or moving away from us. And of course you might be perhaps even more familiar with various police forces doing the same thing to measure how fast you're travelling in your car. They're going to bounce a signal off you, bounce a wave off you, and depending how you're moving, what change in wavelength and frequency they measure. And on a perhaps uh, more philosophical note, we can also look at the light that comes from distant objects in our galaxy, and we can look at whether that has been shifted in frequency as well, and from that we can actually measure how fast things are moving uh, at very, very great distances. Things like galaxies uh, moving around, uh, colliding with each other, we can actually tell how fast they're going by using this idea of the Doppler effect. Now that finishes up this module on waves and sound. We've covered quite a lot of ground here, from the very first ideas of waves being disturbances through medium, the properties that we need to describe waves, various wave phenomena like interference and superposition, and now we've been looking at this idea of the Doppler effect. It's worth going over some of those again to make sure you understand all of the physics that's in there. And what we're going to be doing next in the third module is looking at electricity and magnetism, covering a whole range of topics again from what electric charge is, electricity as current flowing, magnetic fields, and in fact, surprisingly, magnetism and electricity interact very, very strongly with each other. So I look forward to seeing you then.